for so long and for this day I prayed that the stars would help me guide my way home. Lost in the land of our ancestors, who knew it was the dirt beneath our feet? That's not where they tried to tell us. For years in school, we were gone off McGraw-Hill textbooks. No truth, no shame. And at the point that I realized the truth had been disguised, that I'm not African, I despise that lie. Who am I? For generations, my people stayed gone off idols made of stick and stone, the rape babies of Rome, the divided slaves of Egypt, subservient to the united fake Jews and the wild Gentiles from the cave, a confused Jigaboo slave from Timbuktu to New Babylon. For centuries, the truth stayed hidden. History got rewritten on scrolls in vermilion. And manipulated Mississippians from Corinthians to Philippians. people have been waiting a lifetime for right. something like this. Now this is just a tiny bit of information now. But they take it as huge. Right, because it's cracking open the door that was closed for centuries. There's a place in Africa you could say that I'm from. A tribe. Uh, a tribe. I am thrilled. It puts a name, a place, a location, a people. It opens up such possibilities. But the problem is, Sierra Leone wasn't the only answer Vi got. A company called Relative Genetics found a match to a single person in the Wobi tribe in the Ivory Coast. Different? Different. Now, I got all excited about that, and uh -huh. this is different? Mm -hmm. Now, how could that happen? Then a third company, Trace Genetics. Your particular sequence matches sequences reported among multiple uh-oh, Mendanka individuals in Senegal. What's up with this? And Family Tree so DNA, the company that linked Vi with Marion in the first place, came up with a whole list of matches. This goes on and on. My goodness. So what do we know about Vi's ancestry? The DNA does indicate that she has distant relatives in the Mende tribe, but she also has relatives in all those other tribes. So no one can say for sure where Vi's maternal ancestor actually came from. When I handed Vi the certificate, she got extremely emotional about it. She wept, and it meant so very much. People want to believe. They want to believe they've gotten an answer. And it's not fair of us to let them believe that we're giving them certain answers, because scientifically, we just can't. Hank Greeley is concerned that the science isn't really there yet for, for you to be giving them the name of a tribe. I think for most companies, I, I would be concerned too. But what about your own company? We, we have he the largest- He didn't exclude you. <laughs> he included you. But we have the largest um, uh, set of uh, sequences from Africa. And so yep. with, that, with that, we're able to provide some level of probability in terms of frequency. But he would say that even though you have the largest database, it's still small on the scope of things. As I said, I share those those concerns. About yourself? Our DNA. And that's the rub. This business of genetic genealogy is fraught with limitations. For one thing, it can only provide information about a tiny fraction of our ancestry. 
Because we get half our DNA from our mothers and half from our fathers, almost all of our DNA gets shuffled and remixed every generation, making it impossible to trace what comes from whom. There are just two bits of DNA that remain pure. The Y chromosome, which passes directly from father to son, and something called mitochondrial DNA, which passes unchanged from mother to child. Hank Greeley, a law professor at Stanford University, has studied this new field. He worries that people don't realize just how many ancestors they actually have. Eight generations ago, both you and I had 256 great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. Wait, you're saying that if you go back eight generations, uh -huh. we have 256 great-great-great-great-grandparents? Yes, it doubles every generation. So you've got two parents, you have four grandparents, you have eight great-grandparents, <laughs> 16 great-great-grandparents, and it adds up fast. It adds up so fast, in fact, that if you go back 20 generations, you've got over a million grandparents. 1,048,576, to be exact. And in each generation, DNA testing can provide information about only two of them. So you could be Peruvian on your mother's 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 side, Japanese on your father's 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 side, Swedish on everything else. <laughs> and you'll and, never know. And you'll never know the Swedish from the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial DNA. Now you've looked at several of these companies that are doing these tests. Yes. Do you think that they explain what you just explained to us? No. Uh, I don't think any of them does as good a job of pointing out the limitations. But, you know, businesses often don't go around telling you how weak their product is. We don't oversell. I mean, we just say, look, we provide a service. If you're interested in exploring a tiny bit of your DNA and trace its ancestry, we can do that. When you say it's a tiny little amount? It's less than 0.1%. And that's pretty teeny. Yeah, but for people who know nothing about any of them, I think it's very important. When you say it's a tiny little amount? It's less than 0.1%. And that's pretty teeny. Yeah, but for people who know nothing about any of them, I think it's very important. The recent attention being pushed toward ancestry companies is far more than just a ploy to extract priceless DNA for medical research, it's also a method of pushing the false historical narrative among black Americans that their ancestors were not here before the first Europeans. This process is manufactured, propped through marketing specifically to people based upon the supposed scientific credibility of the DNA extraction process. The term DNA has become a trigger word, meaning accurate or foolproof, as it's seen to the public. But how accurate could a DNA test possibly be, considering we have 256 grandparents in eight generations and only two can be highlighted through a DNA test? DNA should never be confused with ancestry. Without doubt, this is an extremely vague result for a process that most people think is foolproof. Surely there's a better way. And in fact, there is. Public birth records. The most accurate process of tracing one's genealogy. How far can you trace your lineage? If your ancestors were slaves, did they even keep records? Of course they did. Did you read those results? 20% European. You are one-fifth white. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm horrible in sports, so maybe this ex <laughs> explains that. My jump shot is horrible. 19% <laughs> European. Are you surprised to know that you have that much European ancestry? I guess so. As dark-complected as I am. 
means you're third white. Well, that's uh, surprise. Surprising. <laughs> surprise. You are 33% European. Really? I'm 50-50 to my horror. Yeah. The chairman of African American Studies at Harvard at the time is a half a white man. Yeah. <laughs> Surprising. Here is a prime example of how disgustingly low the world will go to hide who you truly are. They hire their porch monkey propaganda puppets at institutions like Harvard and make them dean of the Department of African American Studies. In a hundred years, academia will support the idea that blacks are descended from Europeans and Native Americans no longer exist. But why isn't Native American DNA showing up in test results? Go to Google right now and check out the hundreds upon thousands of complaints from people claiming that they have Native American ancestry but the results came back and they were sitting there with the Don Cheadle face all these Native American grandparents well according to Ancestry.com in my heritage and 23andMe and a slew of other DNA charlatans your grandparents lied to you and everybody about who they were and about who you are. According to them, your grandparents are liars. And their DNA test proves that. So what's the real reason Native American ancestry doesn't show up on any DNA tests? Just as with anything else, money power control fact native american tribes are discouraged from sharing their dna with any research company and nearly all tribes have declined participation in such studies imagine millions more people claiming indigenous heritage and think about the amount of money land and resources the federal government would have to commit to those people on their behalf. But at its root, the true reason for this DNA propaganda is to push the false historical narrative of all black Americans being from Africa for the purposes of countering our will to claim what is rightfully ours. One thing that you will often hear is that Native Americans aren't black, they're red with straight hair. When someone makes a statement like this, inevitably it's just because they've been totally brainwashed with a fraudulent historical perspective. Yes, long before Europeans touched the Americas, the Mongoloid Asian people crossed the Bering Strait through Alaska and started to settle here in the Americas centuries prior. But it wasn't like no one was here. The indigenous people of the Americas were and have always been black. The image that has been promoted is that of a Euro-Mongoloid hybrid and is in no way a factual representation of a true Aboriginal American. However, for centuries, both of these populations coexisted. But how did this come to be? Surely, if Native Americans were black, 
there would be some sort of evidence and since most people have never seen a black Indian they just assume they never existed let's dig through the pages of history to identify the deception of our past Hernando de Soto was one of the first colonial explorers to travel into the interior of the Americas. Christopher Columbus never explored deeply into intercontinental lands, only in the Caribbean, the coast of Central America, and a few areas on the coast of South America. De Soto was far more influential in westward expansion and the treachery of the conquistador. Here's a quote from the narratives of the career of Hernando de Soto. The expeditions of de Soto and Coronado were the most elaborate efforts made by the Spaniards to explore the interior of North America and in some respects they have never been surpassed in the later history of the country. Between them, they nearly spanned the continent from Georgia to the Gulf of California. Of the two, that of DeSoto excited the most interest at the time, and this distinction it still retains. It was the first extensive exploration of at least six of our southern states, and their written history opens with the narratives which tell its story. These same narratives contain the earliest descriptions which we possess of the life and manners of the southern Indians so famous in literature and history. The Choctaws, the Cherokees, the Creeks, and the Seminoles, these narratives also record the discovery of the Mississippi River and the story of the first voyage upon it by Europeans. As a young man, Hernando de Soto made his first voyage to the Americas before the age of 20. This was seen as quite the accomplishment. On his second trip, he teamed up with a unit of other Spaniards and ransacked Nicaragua. Later on that same voyage, de Soto was an instrumental player in overthrowing the Incan Empire. After executing women, children, chiefs, princes, and kings, the Spanish overthrew Cusco, the capital of the Incan Empire. Having ransacked Peru for its riches, de Soto returned to Spain to present his spoils to the Spanish crown. He is well received and accepted into the Order of Santiago. De Soto was now officially a member of the Spanish crown under Queen Isabella and the House of Castile, the very same house that Christopher Columbus sailed under just years earlier. During this time in New World discovery, Rome was aggressively sending fleets to the New World. And under papal bull Dum Diversus 1452, the Pope decreed that all non-Christians will be subjugated to perpetual slavery. Then in 1493, Pope Alexander, Caesar Borgia's father, signed Intercatero, which extended that infinite slavery under God to all lands west and south of the Cape Verde Islands. 
the Pope also gave exclusive rights to the families of Portugal and Spain, Ferdinand and the House of Aragon, and of course, Queen Isabella and the House of Castile. On his final trip, De Soto was given permission to colonize Spanish Florida and the southeastern United States. The southeastern part of the country had the highest concentration of indigenous Native Americans. That fact still holds true to this day. As the Spanish arrived, the natives let off smoke signals up and down the coast to warn of the Spanish fleet. When DeSoto landed in Florida, he brought with him over 600 men, over 200 horses, and hundreds of pigs. A little known fact about the conquistadors. They brought attack dogs, mostly mastiffs and hounds who were fed a steady diet of human flesh and trained to kill. Most villages were small with less than a dozen homes. DeSoto and his men would roll 300 deep up on these villages. DeSoto would read a statement to these natives as he arrived. You and all your lands now belong to the crown of Spain. Submit and accept Jesus as Lord and you will be spared. And should you refuse with the aid of God, we will enter your land against you with force and we will make war with you in every place and by every means we can and are able. We will put you, your wives and children into slavery. We will take your property and we will do you all the harm and evil we can and that's exactly what they did DeSoto was well schooled in the sport of slaying Indians DeSoto and the Spaniard savages pillaged from the coast of Tampa Bay through Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Memphis. A picture of DeSoto hangs in the White House, heralding him as a hero and as the man who discovered the Mississippi River. According to the official academic narrative, these people must have never existed. Until present day, thousands of mounds are still found all over the Mississippi Basin and the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, including the Cahokia Mounds in Cairo, Illinois, which at one point in time was a city bigger than London and Rome. Contrary to historical perspective, the Spaniards faced a tremendous adversary in the Indians from the southeast. An earlier Spanish expedition was subdued when the Indians from the southeast captured a ship and beheaded everyone on board, except for one man who would later become DeSoto's interpreter. 
Whenever DeSoto approached a new village, he ordered everyone to be killed. And for the people who didn't fight back, they were taken as slaves. And some were forced by the threat of torture and death to take arms against their own people. In nearly every case, DeSoto and his men outnumbered the natives three to one, sometimes as much as 10 to one. His army numbered nearly a thousand men, half of which were captive slaves being used as frontline ragdoll pawns during the battles that broke out between the Spanish Romans and the Indians. When a battle ensued, it was reported that many Indians from the fighting tribes were as young as four years old, and these children would even take their own life in lieu of being captured by a cruel Spaniard. Women and children fought bravely until they were eventually cut down and either retreated or taken as slaves. The Spaniards had still, which the natives did not. They also had a fleet of mounted knights on horseback to come rescue any Spaniard who got in trouble. And let's not forget about the cannibal attack dogs. But of all this, these would not be the Europeans' most effective weapon. Their most effective weapon was disease. The colonizers brought smallpox and a myriad of other diseases which eventually would kill almost half of the native population. It was no secret, just as in the voyages of Christopher Columbus, the Spaniards were extremely motivated to find gold. Whenever DeSoto ransacked a village, he would aggressively interrogate any surviving captive as to the whereabouts of possible gold. Always will remain the countless stories of this Spaniard's savagery. His men killed hundreds of thousands of black natives from Florida to Georgia to North Carolina to Tennessee to Mississippi, all while enslaving any survivors. These men, not just in North America, but in South America before, responsible for the plague that wiped out half the population. On later expeditions, it was noted that the once thriving Mississippi Basin, lined with mounds, people, and civilization, had been decimated, and where there had been hundreds of villages remained just a few. Every legitimate account of the Native Americans prior to 1700 depicted a dark to copper skinned race of people who dominated the landscape. But after 1800, 
every single image of an indigenous American changed. But why is that? When we look at the Spanish depictions of the natives, much is left to the imagination. And it's beyond obvious that these portrayals were completely fabricated in order to characterize the natives as subhuman barbarians. The fake Jew news of Spain often showed the natives as bald, white savages. In 1524, over a decade before DeSoto pillaged Florida, Italian explorer Gianni de Verrazzano said this. The complexion of these people is black, not much different from that of the Ethiopians. Their hair is black and thick and not very long, tied behind the back of the head like a small tail. As for the physique of these men, they are well proportioned of medium height, a little taller than we are. They have broad chests, strong arms, and the legs and other parts of the body are well composed. There is nothing else, except that they tend to be broad in the face and they have big black eyes and an attentive and open look. They have a sharp cunning and are agile and swift runners. <laughs> The notable work America by Aldonis Montemus and John Ogilvy is probably the most detailed account produced and illustrated that best describes the New World. Although through history some have argued that because the artist didn't travel to America himself and relied on intelligence, his work was just a fanciful exaggeration. This fact could possibly be true, but his descriptions of other parts of the world were never questioned as unauthentic. Furthermore, his illustrations directly parallel descriptions from hundreds of artists from Europe. Although we have more than enough visual evidence of knowing exactly who these Indians were, something is missing. Where is the rest of the art? During the time when thousands upon thousands of Europeans traveled to the New World, only a few pictorial accounts remain. This era was the supposed European Renaissance, where painting a picture of a bowl of fruit was considered fine art. Yet, where one would expect to have tens of thousands of illustrations, we are left with just a few. These Indians completely scrubbed from history.
Big Shelly, Harry, Harry, Earth, yeah. And we shall.